Hello and welcome everybody and uh, welcome to our uh, webinar series around various topics around uh, patient and community empowerment. Uh, my name is Jim Phillips, I'm the Executive Director for the Centre of Empowering People and Communities, to a not-for-profit network organisation. We, we work right across Europe with a whole number of European partners. I want to just sort of say a huge thank you to our key funders and supporters. So Robert Bosch Stefan, a German uh, uh, institution, has kindly made all of this work possible and allows us to provide these resources completely free of charge. And also to the European Health Futures Forum, who host the uh, CEMPAC uh, project and program. And a, and a big thank you to them as well. I'm really, really pleased to be able to introduce our two speakers, panelists today. Uh, so first of all, uh, Lynn Craven. Uh, Lynn, I've, been, I've known for many years and, and worked with for, on a number of projects from the Expert Patient Programme through to Co-Creating Health. And some of you might know Lynn through her work as a patient advocate and patient leader as well. And also a massive welcome to uh, Andrew McDowell from TPC Health, another colleague worked with extensively uh, over the years, who has huge, huge experience, probably a, a real sort of leader in the whole area of coaching and, and health coaching. We'll be talking us through how those core skills really support and enable the workforce to uh, work with people to in, enable self-management. I want to kick off really just by looking at a couple of things. Traditionally, patient education was very much based on what clinicians thought people should know about managing their health condition, and also comprised of telling people what they then should do to manage their health condition. Um, I would like to think, was, think things have changed considerably uh, since uh, some of the earlier patient education programs developed in the 60s, 70s and 80s. But uh, So let's just begin to put this in context and history around how we've developed from, from that sort of very traditional view of patient education and how we got to self-management. It, it's first well worth making the point that even health promotion wasn't really on the agenda in terms of health policy until an international conference on health promotion in Ottawa in 1986 really put down the marker around the importance of health promotion and with that the concept of self-care as well and through that sort of uh, evolving into self-management and it made the statement that people cannot achieve their fullest health and well-being unless they are able to take control of those things which determine their own health. Yeah? Uh, and, and that's quite a sort of key statement, really, which came out of that and was then further adopted by uh, WHO and uh, 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 other organisations as well as, uh, as a principle going forward. Previous to that, there was work going on in Stanford University, uh, who, where they developed, going back to 1979 in actual fact, developed an arthritis self-management program. This was uh, developed by Ben, which was a then young researcher called, uh, which is now Professor Kate Lorick. And she took a different approach. So she looked at what tra a traditional patient education and actually realised that people weren't getting an awful lot from them. And what she did was she actually went out and spoke to people with arthritis and actually asked them, what's important to you? What actually matters to you in terms of managing your arthritis? And out of that, uh, she, they developed the first patient education programmes, which were really then, uh, then based on self-efficacy theory, the work of uh, Albert Bandura and others, and also social learning. Because what she realised from those interviews was that in actual fact people weren't interested around how their joints worked or, you know, the way your white blood cells attacked something or another and all this biology which, you know, people thought they should know. What they wanted to know quite simply was, how do I get the kids to school when I'm in real bad pain? How, I, how do I do the shopping? How do I manage tiredness and fatigue? How do I carry on working with this? That's what she found out what, what people wanted to know. Um, 
So that was the, the real start of programs which are based on what matters to me and not what's a matter with me. And those programs are still running, but they run uh, worldwide um, and probably one of the strongest evidence-based uh, structured self-management programs uh, which are available. At a similar time within Europe and within, within England, uh, it, it became more and more apparent around the whole issue as we began to look at a psychosocial model of health and, and healthcare, that more and more it became apparent that the role of the individual in managing their health was seen as more and more important. And in 1999, we had the Saving Lives Our Healthier Nation published in England which for the first time sort of set out the notion of self-management uh, in terms of policy and put forward the concept of the expert patient as well. So the idea is that uh, people are supported to become expert in their condition, i.e. what we now say having the competence, knowledge and skills or the health literacy or that or are activated. Uh, those words were, weren't used then then they're better able to engage in their health and have better health outcomes. And that led to the launch of the first national self-management program in England, the uh, Expert Patient Program. At a similar time, work was going on uh, in Denmark with Danish colleagues in, in the Danish Committee for Health Education in Switzerland, the uh, Korean Institute, uh, led by Elona Kickbush and others, and, and Netherlands and elsewhere to adopt similar programs and broaden their development. And now if we look at both those countries, particularly Denmark, we see self-management education actually rooted through their healthcare system so as part of that. And supporting that burgeoning rollout around the concept of, of self-management and patient empowerment, uh, there's a whole series of international conferences dedicated to the concept of patient empowerment. Um, culminating in bringing all the European chief medical officers together to really ensure that uh, concepts of patient empowerment, uh, self-management began to be rooted within European healthcare policy go, going forward. And for those of us who are, are in England, we know that where we are today in terms of the whole concept of personalised care, that's how far those things have developed from those earlier starts and those sort of different strands which have come together over, over, over the years to become a much more coherent approach towards self-management and this whole area. A number of models emerging out of there. Some of you will recognize the Wagner model of chronic care, this idea of the informed, activated patient working with prepared, proactive uh, teams. Um, out of that, so looking at the whole thing of informed, activated patients, comes a range of self-management support for people with long-term conditions. So we have structured group courses, time limited, often over six weeks, can be peer-led, can be professionally led or mixed. Self-directed programs, people using online apps, workbooks, group coaching approaches, one-to-one -one health coaching, structured peer support, in mental health, uh, the rise of wellness recovery action planning. And as we look across the range of self-management interventions, what we see here is that evidence leans towards programs based on theoretical models and approaches such as self-efficacy, health literacy, positive psychology, motivational interviewing and social learning theory as some being some of the most effective mechanisms which enable people to develop the competent knowledge and skills around managing their health conditions. And if we go completely global now and actually pick up on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which majority of UN nations, well, which all UN nations have actually signed up to. Interesting when you look at this, um, uh, at a recent uh, 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 presentation by uh, WHO Regional Director for Europe, they're really sort of advocating now the whole thing around health literacy and social mobilization as a way of achieving these, and how health literacy actually underpins a lot of the, the, the sustainable development goals uh, with, with the United Nations. 
issues such as poverty, uh, uh, access to healthcare and everything are actually quite often underpinned by issues such as health literacy. And of course, self-management is a process or support for self-management. It's a process which we develop uh, health literate uh, communities and health literate uh, organizations uh, as well to overall sort of support the, the long-term uh, development um, uh, of access to healthcare and better outcomes. And as you begin to look at this, a number of sort of four key areas that begin to emerge, and this is a bit of a developing a, a, a manifesto that Senpax is working on with parties. One in that, you know, as citizens are enabled to develop health literacy and vast for confidence, knowledge, and skills to manage their health and well being in line with what matters most to them. Where the health and care workforce have the competencies to work in partnership with people to help them achieve the biopsychosocial outcomes that are important and matter to them. That health and care systems and policies designed in partnership with citizens based on principles of co production to enable person centered care. And that barriers to citizens to access universal health care are proactively reduced. So we've got these sort of core. Sort of areas, as it were, leading to improved outcomes. And it's worth saying that self management has probably got some of the strongest evidence based literature and the RCTs, etc., behind it through a, 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 a lot of these areas. There's a huge uh, pedigree of research and expertise which sits behind this whole body of work, as it were. And as we see this sort of coming to, together, you know, but, but we tend to get, get this flow. Um, uh, we we see, see this movement. Um, some of you will recognize this. It's a bit of an adaptation of the uh, personalized care model in, in England. Uh, we started adapting this a, a little bit to pick up other models as well, including the, the chronic care model, uh, and looking at how this is applicable in healthcare systems. Uh, worldwide around these basic principles. So one person has a change in health status, there's shared decision making, agreeing a course of action, deal with long-term conditions, have personalized care and support plans based on what's important to the person. Everyone's allowed to able to access the optimal clinical pathway to achieve the outcomes they want to. But importantly, psychosocial support needs are met with supportive self-management and community-based support. And that, of course, is the topic of today's webinar around uh, self-management support. So I just wanted to provide that overview and that uh, contextualization, really, because I think it's important when we're working within our local healthcare system, uh, getting asked about this, we, we're not always aware of, around the whole sort of breadth around this this particular topic, uh, some of the history around the other topic, and also the huge importance of this, uh, particularly around um, developing countries and emerging healthcare systems as well, and the role self-management has played in some of those countries around empowering people to be able to challenge the quality of the healthcare, but also take control of their own sort of health and well-being as well. And we saw this a lot, particularly with things like HIV, for example, in Africa and, and, and other countries as well. 